Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Ilias Vatatia. I'm working with uh, Gabor Chani at the University of Cambridge, and I will present you today uh, our work on unifying the design space of free uh, equivariant interatomic potentials. Uh, and it's a direct follow up to the talk of David. Uh, so this work uh, started uh, by seeing the very, very large amount of uh, new architectures for interatomic potential coming uh, each year. And uh, we wanted to, un to understand really what was the, the connection between this uh, myriad of new architectures. And particularly notable among these are the uh, atomic cluster expansion produced by half droughts that David mentioned that unified the uh, atom density bias descriptors and also and then NEQIP, a message passing neural network that uh, uh, used equivariant features and uh, outperformed uh, by a large margin the existing uh, approaches. And so we wanted to understand what are the formal relationship between these different approaches. And you have in one side the atomic descriptors and the other side you have the equivalent neural networks and are they connected in, in any way. And this is something that a lot of people in the community have been thinking about. Uh, and we are uh, sharing our point of view on that. And also can this connection uh, inform us on what are the very important choices in this full design space uh, that makes this uh, approach is successful. And so the question was, uh, 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 in all these new machine learning papers, what are the key ingredients that they put in that really make them successful compared to the previous approaches? And so we will try to provide a unifying framework to put all these uh, mod or all these approaches on the same footing in order to compare them together. And then we'll highlight the key choices of the different approach in the literature within this framework, give a, a special study of NEQIP uh, we have a set of experiments to really shed some light on the design space that made NEQIP so successful, and then introduce a new model, Botnet, which is a modification of NEQIP uh, with an interval architecture that reached excellent accuracy with uh, uh, a much simpler architecture. So just to recap on MPNNs, what are machine learning neural networks? So they are graph neural networks, and they map label graphs to some vector spaces. And in atomic, uh, interatomic potentials, labels of the atoms are usually the states. So this is what uh, David introduced, a state of an atom describes the configuration of the, of the, the, the matter of the molecule you're looking at. And, and these three properties, the, uh, the Cartesian position vector, the set of attributes that can be the chemical elements and some learnable features. And uh, we call them semi-local because of the message passing. These features can depend on a quite long uh, receptive field, up to 14 angstrom if you have a, a, a lot of message passing. So this, this information contains semi-local information of the, of, the, of the atom. And so um, uh, typical MPNNs have three steps, the message passing phase, the update phase, and the readout phase. And in the message passing phase, uh, a message is collected from the neighboring states of the atoms. So each, uh, each atom has neighbors, J, and then you embed uh, this neighboring, uh, the, the state of the neighboring atom in some function, and then you collect them to recenter around one atom. And uh, this operation, this big splash, needs to be permutation invariant. So this is a permutation invariant pooling, and if you swap atoms of the same time within the local environments, then you, don't, you, you need to not change the message. And lambda is a normalization constant that will become very important later in the experiments. Uh, and so then after the message passing phase, you have the update state, the update phase. So the state of an atom is updated based on this aggregated message via an update function. And then you get uh, the, 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 the state of the atom at the new uh, stage. And at the end, a readout phase, which maps this collection of states to a quantity, which is usually a scalar, the energy. And some model opts to just readout the last state of the network and other readouts multiple states and their freedom in that. Uh, so I will skip on equivalence, but it's very important as uh, uh, Boris and David uh, highlight to put in the, 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 the symmetries of the physics inside. And in equivalent MPNN, the way you do that is that you put some uh, constraints on the messages. So they transform in a, in a particular way uh, uh, by the action of the symmetry on the states. So if you change the configuration, the message needs to, 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 to transform in a very particular way. 
uh, that are given by the O3 irreducible notation. And uh, as David uh, mentioned, uh, a very successful approximation of the potential energy surface uh, is the uh, body order expansion that expand uh, a function in, in, in hierarchical terms. And this can be transferred to also the concept of message passing. And we can define what is a body order message, which means that this is the, this equation that this message will have some hierarchical form. And the, the, the meaning of uh, uh, this T number is the order of the, the, the body order of this message, which is the largest integer where the derivative uh, uh, is, is non-zero, which means that we have truncated this expansion to some order, and this t is this that order, and all the higher order derivative will be zero. Uh, and this is the concept of body ordering in a message. And, uh, and so now we have reviewed the message passing, uh, a little, uh, the message passing framework, and David has introduced uh, this uh, general ace, and how can we connect them together? And the, the central idea on that is that all the atom centers message passing can be understood as, as some kind of uh, uh, multi ace, so stacking of different ace. And the crucial idea is that you will construct the message of the message passing network via the ace basis, because this A basis gives you a way to construct symmetric uh, features. And so the key idea is that you want message that are symmetric, so you will. Uh, uh, take the ace basis and construct the message this way. And this is a generalization of classical MPNN because no, the message won't be two body. In most uh, MPNNs, the message are only two body. No, the, 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 mess the messages can be many body. And then the updates will connect the ace layer uh, together. And we need to generate the one particle basis, which are the edges features to incorporate the previous ace inside it. And the way to do that is via the T function. The T function will not only be a function of the attributes, but it also be the function of the previous features that will be generated via the ACE formalism. And so this way you can re-expand uh, uh, iteratively in new ACE basis and reconstruct the message this way. And, um, and uh, the connection between NPNN and ACE is that the edge embedding of NPNN is actually the one particle function of ACE and the pooling operation is the tensor product and symmetrization of the ACE. And this way you have the full equation that actually unifies the atom centered and the uh, NPNN description that has some very key parameters. So the crucial parameter of this framework is the number of message passing layers. So the number of time you re-expand in the ACE basis, the maximum order of the spherical expansion, which is the order you go in the one particle basis. So how, how much angular information you put on the edges. And then you have the L max, which is the, the symmetry you will pass on, on uh, the symmetry of the messages will pass between ACE layers. And then you have the new, which is the correlation order at each message, because no, the message are not only two body, but they can be many body. So you have the decision to make of what is the correlation order that you will put at each layer. So this is the new. And then the final uh, crucial part to uh, decision to make is the coupling. So you have a large spectrum of coupling that will influence the speed and the computational cost of your model. And this is described as this D index that defines how much you will couple things within one layer. So usually in message passing, nothing is coupled. But the reason for that is because they are on, only using two body. As uh, uh, David mentioned, when you are creating this tensor product of higher orders, you have the choice to couple things or not. For example, you can couple the species or not. And this is what the V index will tell you. And so now we have classified a large range of uh, message passing and also, also atomic center that, uh, with these hyperparameters. And you can see that uh, all these are just special choices of this operator. So for example, Schnett will be uh, taking just scalars in the world particle basis, not having invariant messages and having correlation order one at each layer. And Nequip will be having an equivariant uh, one particle basis, an equivalent message, and also taking just correlation order one at each uh, message. And linear ace in the other, uh, in the other uh, uh, side will be just a one layer but with equiva high equivalence in the one particle basis and invariance in the message. 
And you can see that you can actually classify all these design space of most of the previously published models in a single table via these hyperparameters. And one uh, important also aspect of this classification are the uh, models that use Cartesian vectors. And we uh, mentioned them here, for example, EGN and pain that they are equivalent to this framework just by a change of basis. So the one particle base, uh, basis will be expressed in Cartesian format, but because they are using only vectors, just a change of basis can merge them into the same framework. Okay, so now we have classified all these uh, models uh, and can we try to really understand what is important within this design space? How can we probe the design choices of all this myriad of architecture to really take away what is important is in, in the design space? And the way to do that, we have created this architecture, which is botnet, body order tensor network, which is halfway between linear A's and NEQIP. And so the reason for that is that it's a message passing network. So you have different layers, but it's completely body ordered. And the reason why it's completely body ordered is that we have removed all the non-linearities that uh, breaks the body ordering of the uh, usual MPNNs. And the uh, body order expansion comes from the iterative layers. So at each, at each layer, the, 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 the features are created are just um, two body, but because you are recursively doing message passing, you create a, a higher uh, expansion of the, of the potential energy surface. And then at the end, you map each of these features to one contribution of the energy, which is exactly the contribution of this body order term. So you have a hierarchical thing, build the hierarchical expansion of the, of the, body, of the potential energy surface built in inside the network, which gives this interpretable architecture. And this will serve as a probe between linear A's, botnet, and NECWIP, which have like a line connecting in this, in this design space. And now we will probe some different choices. First, the nonlinearities. So there are most MPN and use nonlinearities. But in botnet, we don't use any nonlinearities because we will conserve body ordering. And then we showed that actually not using any nonlinearities can give very, very good performance. So we reach the same performance on, of, uh, as NECWIP without a single nonlinearity in the model, except the coupling via the tensor product. So it means that really what is important in this network is the tensor product, not the pointwise nonlinearities. And one key, key, key a uh, key uh, asset also is that when you put just one linearity at the last readout to account for the truncated terms in the expansion, so you have a very well-defined expansion, and then you have a residual part that is non-bound ordered, but you control because it's just the last part. Uh, this way you can get an, an extra 20% outperforming neck with, uh, 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 just with one point, pointwise linearity in the whole network. So this is this interstatic that we build help us to really uh, tar uh, targets the, the, the precise architecture that you wanted. Uh, one other thing that we found very important is in this network is the normalization. So normalization even uh, is very important for uh, reaching high accuracy and in particular for the, the, the regime with very low amount of configuration uh, in your training set. And uh, we found that just changing this lambda in the equation of the aggregation can give over a 50% change in accuracy. So you see that by putting this lambda equal to one in NECWIP, we lose 50% of accuracy. And by putting it to uh, the square root of the number of average number, we, the, the, the number of average neighbors, uh, we recover NECWIP accuracy. And by changing it again, not to the square root, but to the average number itself, you can win another 10% on NECWIP. So normalization is very key inside the network in low data regime. And also the data normalization is very important. So uh, most of the network use the scale shift uh, data normalization, which takes the, the, the energy of the training set and uh, subtract the, the, the mean of the training set. Uh, and um, and uh, other approaches like the atomic, atomic density approaches, not doesn't use that, but just scale by the uh, E0 of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the density functional theory used. Um, and we see that in our networks, this changes the loss, the training dynamics, and you can also lose another 10 or 20% by choosing uh, the right normalization. So normalization is very key, but it has effect on the generalization of the networks. So you see that using 
uh, scale shift normalization, which are the SSH model in this plot, you have very, very good accuracy in, in domain. But when you start doing out of domain, very extreme abstraction or uh, stretching modes, then they completely fall apart and they cannot represent the potential energy surface. And the reason for that is that you have put it the wrong limit. So normalization needs to have the, uh, also physical property. And even more important, when you know that you would break bonds, you cannot do anything with your data. And you see that both in the stretch in the stretching mode and the abstraction, the, the scale shift models, which are more accurate, completely fall apart. Uh, and uh, now some benchmarking on uh, the free VPA data set that Boris and David talked about. We see that botnet can actually reach state of the art uh, performance uh, just with a very simple architecture. Uh, and uh, we also note that, uh, as Boris said, that botnet and NECWIP are uh, far ahead of the other um, other um, uh, models, and uh, there are further work in this uh, direction to really understand also uh, what makes these two uh, stand out. Uh, a final extrapolation uh, test. So um, here we have taken the, the potential energy surface of the free BPA by rotating uh, the angles, uh, free angles of the of this molecule, and uh, then we have taken. 1D slices in this potential energy uh, curve. Uh, and these are the black uh, slices in the 2D heat map. And we have plotted down uh, the uh, prediction of the models. And um, you can see that the models do extremely well, um, in particular botnet and NECWIP, even with very, very low amount of data. Uh, and uh, if, and this, the, the middle cut has no data, it's, it's, it's a very extreme extrapolation, but NECWIP and botnet can still give reasonably well uh, accuracy, which is uh, very impressive. Uh, and uh, they are all smooth, uh, smooth potentials with, uh, uh, with uh, good predictions. So uh, at the conclusion, we have proposed the mathematical framework to unify uh, uh, most existing ML potentials approaches, including symmetric potentials and also equivalent message passing. And then we have introduced a new model, Botnet, which uh, with an interpolable architecture combines state of the art accuracy, uh, accuracy with also great extrapolation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the collaborators on this project, which is a joint work uh, with the uh, uh, Gabor Chani group in Cambridge and the Harvard group of uh, Boris Kowinski in Har uh, uh, and also Harv Drott and Christa uh, Christoph Ortner. Uh, uh, and uh, we want to say that uh, the preprint will be soon out. Uh, we hope if you want to dive in the mathematical framework, uh, and we will give a much longer talk where we also dive in other aspects of this framework uh, uh, in the ACE seminar that we invite you to follow to dive more into the framework. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Elise, for this amazing talk. Now we have time for a few questions from the audience. So I will start with a question. So uh, I'm a bit impressed by the whole architecture of this uh, thing, but it's it's quite hard to grasp uh, what is the computational scaling of the object in terms of the total number of atoms, the, the average number of atoms in a neighborhood and the number of species. Do you have any specific uh, idea or actual number on these? So, uh, so botnet suffers from the same problem as other message passing networks, which is exactly what Boris said, is that the receptive field you have is very large. And uh, then it's that easy to parallelize. And also equivalent message passing uh, costs a lot because of the symmetrization uh, part. Uh, so they are not the fat fastest model, but uh, they are also way more accurate. And so you have the freedom in the design, design space to lose a bit of accuracy, but to gain in speed or, or reduce a lot the computational cost. So now the design space allows you in all these models to really choose between very, very accurate models and also fast, so a, a very fast models. So I, the bold column numbers will be quite slow models actually, but you can still build very accurate models with few number of hyperparameters uh, that will probably compete with the other approach in terms of speed and still be very, very accurate. So yeah, and, and this is the point also of all this design space is also in the future to try to target the best approach for both speed, uh, computational cost, and also 
uh, accuracy because we haven't explored the full uh, design space yet. We have one question from the audience. Hello, thank you. Um, I have a question related to this, uh, basically this um, contrast between uh, what Boris was saying about Allegro, about not needing message passing and, and, and what, what you guys just talked about. Um, and, and I guess the, the question is, there's kind of two things that the message passing does. On one hand, it, it gives you richer information about the environment of each atom, and then it also gets you longer range information. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I guess to kind of decouple these two things, um, you could just look at also at the influence of the cutoff on a non-message pa passing model. So do you have any insight on that? So <clears throat> I, I can answer this. So I think um, if you look at the, the question is, in, in each NACWIP message passing, if you ignore the nonlinearities, which seem to be not very important, then if you, if you don't have nonlinearities in NACWIP, then each message passing increases the local body order by one. So basically the question is that, do you need five layers of NACWIP to reach the very good accuracy to, to build up the body order or to get, to, to get some long range information? And then what you see from Allegro and what you see from, from maybe ACE as well is that actually the local high local correlation order is much more important than the, the semi-locality. And, and what Allegro is, is, is basically, uh, Allegro is building up this local information from these pair tensor products is, is, is very similar to what ACE does, but it has a lot more like multi-layer perceptrons inside. So it's, it is a much more over-parameterized version of, of because in, in ACE, we don't have any MLPs in the traditional ACE, <laughs> so to say, whereas Allegro has, a, and, and also NICE in, to some extent, these, these are very related uh, approaches. They have introduced a lot more flexibility into building up this local high body order uh, description. And one point, so one also comment on that is that if you look at the agro paper, you still need to, uh, to use some large cutoff on some molecules, right? So maybe you need a bit of semi-local. It depends on what you call semi-local. So if semi-local is 10 angstrom or if it's 20 or off, because uh, usually this atom, atom center of the description use a cutoff of around five or four angstrom. And, uh, uh, Allegro, for example, use in some cases a seven uh, angstrom or nine angstrom cutoff. So, do you call that semi local or local? This is up to discussion, right? Okay, thank you very much to Boris Kosinski, David Kovacs, and Ilias Batatia for these amazing talks. I'm sure they will be happy to discuss them with you further. Uh, now we have a coffee break and we start at 40 sharp. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.